All right, here we are. Hello and welcome. We have another episode of Let's Get Personal. And so my name is Ian. And so without any further ado, let's simply get personal. Would you kindly introduce yourself? Um, so my name is Sanaya, um, but I go by Sin. You can call me either or. Sin is just a lot more simpler. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. <laughs> All right, all right. So what are you up to lately? What what catches your attention? You know, I am a new mother. So, and when I say new, I mean like 16 months in, but also like first time. So my life kind of revolves around just being a mom. Uh, thankfully, I do not have to work. Um, and like leave him and you know do the homogenized thing of you know the nine to five and or just even have to worry about money um well mm. the mind still likes to worry about money but i don't have to i'm not in the situation where i have to go out and make something happen so i'm very grateful for that um yeah. and and yeah i, I believe that you invited me on here based on something that I shared um, in a group and what I am going to share with you has kind of led me up into where I am now. <laughs> so I guess yeah. I'll get into that eventually. Yeah, please. It's something I was reading a little bit of your story that you shared and it just seemed like quite an encounter with the forces of life. And I wanted to have an opportunity to talk about that and to kind of explore what went what went down, what went up, what occurred, what's going on in the head, in the body, and just to see what's there. Awesome. So from what I was hearing, there is somewhat of a relation between how you got introduced into the whole human design thing and how that led you in your story to where we are now. And mm -hmm. so wherever is the most natural beginning point for some self story, whether it be that moment of discovering human design or maybe something before then that got you along to start in this path, mm -hmm. uh, please share a little bit of what you can on your story. Okay. So yeah, I guess I'll start a little bit before um, HD and I guess a little disclaimer for people watching. Um, I am, right-brained and right-minded so i sometimes can get off topic or what you may think is off topic <laughs> but for me it's perfectly natural um to not have a point to not have a focus as a right mind individual i am um, a reservoir of resources and information and i take in everything and what comes out of me is essentially being pulled out by the other and it's actually for the other. So like I share things and they're not for me, they're for whoever's listening. And maybe, you know, whoever's listening may not think, especially if they're left-minded, like, where is she going with this? Like, what's the point? <laughs> Just keep in mind that it's, you know, correct for me to be such a way. But also, Ian, if you, um, like I'm going too off or something, just <laughs> let me know, bring me back, or I might forget. So yeah, I just wanted to give that disclaimer. Um, yeah, 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 I'm happy to hear wherever you're naturally guided to go. Okay, so, um, so yeah, uh, prior to HD, I was living in a van by choice. Um, I have a history of working and I guess I'll, I'll say for everyone watching, I'm a 3-5 splenic projector. So in human design, um, we don't have much energy. Now I am what they consider an energy projector because I do have that root, that adrenaline. Um, but as a rule with them, projectors aren't really supposed to be out there doing the generator thing. And prior to human design, that's exactly what I was doing. Now. Um, I will say that I naturally started to evolve into my projector nature without realizing it. Um, not so much the invitation thing, 
because I feel like that might be the, the more more difficult thing to naturally gravitate towards. But um, just in terms of I started working when I was 13, um, I left my mother's house, uh, me and her like butted heads. Um, to be honest, I think I was a very aware 13 year old where I was able to look at my mom's behavior and I did not resonate with how she carried herself. And I have the 44.5 in my design son in detriment. And now understanding human design, I see why. Uh, Cause that line is called manipulation. It's essentially can, for lack of a better term, be abusive to other people who I don't think are integral um, or I don't think that they're moving in a way that benefits the tribe. Um, so, and that's detriment that I, I really am grateful for because a lot of my other activations, 19.2 um, in specific is in my Saturn. It does discipline me. I'm naturally someone that wants to be of service. And I feel like if I didn't have that 44.5, um, I would be someone that could have been walked all over, taken advantage of, things of that nature. Um, so I'm grateful for that. But yeah, me and my mom butted heads. So, and I, I was, I felt like I was kind of ungrateful as well. Like I'll take accountability for that because she's a not self parent, but she did the best that she could do with at her level of awareness where she was in her experience and learning her chart. You know, she had no choice. Um, I'm compromised seven times <laughs> oh. by her. So in each channel she has, I'm compromised, except for the 2750. So yeah, it's just a, a lot of annoying energy and, and a lot of variables. So I left home at 13. From the age of 13 to 18, I probably lived with her a total of like two years, but like off and on, because I would leave for six months, come back for three months, we get into it, I'd leave again, you know, that type of cycle. Mm -hmm. Um, and all the while I was working because my first job was under the table at my friend's like little Filipino market. And then I um, actually was invited into my first real like on paper job. And I'm from San Francisco, California. So the resources and jobs available for kids my age at that time and probably even today um, we're vast. There's a lot of opportunities to find work in that city. So I remember my neighbor gave my mom the application at the time because that was a time where I was back at home and I applied, got the job and looking back, I'm like, okay, that was correctly invited into the job because I didn't look for anything. It wasn't out searching. Um, and I ended up being at that job for eight years. Um, in, in the, so I left when I was 21 and it was a, a really mature job too for my age. I worked, it was a place called Youthline. This was back be, and Google was around um, cause I'm 31, but it wasn't as widely used. Um, people still called like information lines and stuff like that. Can you tell me when the next movie starts? Like that type of thing. Um, but I also took like suicide calls. I took relationship mm. calls. Um, I learned active listening at a, a really young age. I was a supervisor there. Um, and yeah, I learned a lot about communication and the type of questions to ask. And I feel like that really helped with my projector nature and, and guidance. Um, and while I was there, I actually, because one of the main things we did there was find jobs and provide resources for other youth. So I had access to any other job that came on the market. I would heard about it first. So I was just applying, oh, this little, you know, a job where I'd be there twice a week, I get a stipend, you know, and then this other job, I was there three times a week. So I was like working three to four jobs at one time, a um, wow. hundred hours a week at one point, um, which is ridiculous for objector, but I couldn't keep up with school as a result. And I never really resonated with school. So I dropped out when I was 15 and really just went into the rat race even deeper and was just grinding and working um, and hustling. And I got pretty accustomed to having my own money, to being very independent at a young age. I started driving when I was 15, got my license when I was 16. 
hadn't been without a car, you know, from that point. Um, and yeah, so giving back story to that, just to show how much of a generator I was from such a young age. Um, and so by the time I hit about 25, I started to feel like this isn't what life is all about. Like life should not just be going to work and making money. Like I literally was working like I was Jamaican with six kids and I had no kids at the time. I had no responsibilities, you know. Um, I, I mean, I guess I had rent and stuff, but I made a lot of money, especially once I left that first job I was at when I was 21, because then I went into bartending. Um, and I had worked, started working at Starbucks when I was 18, which made me want to start bartending because I was making tips there. And my 19.2, man, is made me a lot of money because I actually really liked what I was doing. I love to serve people. You know, I love to um, be super like friendly and, and encouraging with my customers and stuff. It was just, I was a natural at it, you know, line two. Yeah. And um, I, I was making a lot of money at Starbucks, what I thought was a lot of money, but then I knew about bartending and the tips that I was making at Starbucks in a week, I could make in a day bartending. So I was like, all right, I wanna do that. And so once I got into bartending, I was able to stop working multiple jobs. I could work, you know, four days a week, five days a week and, and still pay my bills. So I was like, okay, I need to work smarter, not harder. You know, I need to find a way to capitalize on my time, but still make a shit ton of money. So I did the bartending thing for a year. Um, I did not like it. Part of the reason was, well, I, I like serving people, but I didn't like the alcohol atmosphere because I have never had a drink in my life to this day. Um, long story with that. I just, I don't drink anything other but water. I grew up only on water and milk. Um, and then I had went vegan for a period of time, so I stopped drinking milk. But like, I just started drinking smoothies this <laughs> year. Um, I had never drank anything but water. Like, it's just some. I feel like it's splenic rigidity because I was. You would think my digestive type would have been closed. I didn't like to try new things. Um, even when I went vegan, I wasn't like trying all like the plant foods. Like I had avocado for the first time when I was 27 <laughs> and pineapple and mango, like all these things that I was like missing yeah. out on because I didn't want to try. Um, so yeah, I stopped bartending because it's just didn't sit right with me. Um, and then I went moved to serving. So and, and another thing I saw, it was made more sense is because like I would come in and work eight hour shifts as a bartender. I didn't have any bar back and I was doing a lot of physical labor as well. Um, mm. But and then I would see servers, waitresses and stuff come in after me, leave before me and make about the same amount that I was making with less work. So I was like, that's what I need to be doing. <laughs> I need to be right. serving. So I transitioned into serving. Um, I had a few different jobs and then I was invited into this one job and I was literally making like five to six K a month, which isn't like a lot, but like it was for me <laughs> at that time because of my bills. I didn't have much. Um, yeah, five and, to six K and feel like a lot. Right. In California, you know, not so much, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> but not when rent is almost half that. <laughs> Exactly. It was more than that when you consider rent and then all your other expenses. It's not much, which is why I was in a relationship with this um, woman at the time for seven years, and I kind of got locked into that relationship as projectors tend to do. And I knew at like the three year mark that I wanted out of the relationship, but due to some circumstances, um, I ended up staying. And once I finally left her when I was 25, I decided I am not trying to spend all my hard earned money on rent anymore. So I moved into my car at the time. It was a four door sedan Acura. Um, yeah. And I had, I was used to sleeping in the car because of how much um, I would work a lot. So sometimes I would just sleep in my car oh. between jobs. 
So I was like, okay. and my, my seat was super cool, it was like laid all the way back. I'd be pretty comfy in there. Um, so I was like, I can live in my car. Like I work most of the time anyways, like I'm just gonna be sleeping in here. So um, I left her, moved into my car. A couple months later, someone rear-ended me um, and Ooh. totaled out my car. So I, I had fully insured. So I, with the money from that, I bought a van um, and then like did this ghetto ass renovation <laughs> to it, like took out all the seats, put down some plywood, put some like the little tiles that have like the sticky surface on it. And, you know, oh. I made my van a home and this was 2018. Uh, yeah, I was, well, 2019 when I got the van. So yeah, but from 28, end of 28 or mid 2018, all the way up into uh, June of 21, I was living in a vehicle. Um, and mm. at, prior to COVID, I was only working three to four days a week. So I was, and still pulling in like four and a half to 5K a month. So I had a decent amount of money and I was happy. Like I never, you know, there are like pros and cons to everything in life. So like, it's not so ideal to be living in a van, but it worked for me because I'm super, um, what's the word? Like uh, minimalism. Like, at right. A start, I had to give away so much when I'm in the van um, or to my car because I couldn't fit everything in there. And I had an attachment to like material items and whatnot. So I got over that. Um, because of that, which is cool, because, you know, I'm going to tell you guys a different part of the story later. So, yeah, um, I, besides the working aspect, I feel like I really got wrapped up in the spiritual community um, because oh. I was working on myself and felt like there was improvements that needed to be made. I felt like, you know, Positivity was what I wanted to surround myself in. And um, yeah, at that point, I thought that I, you know, was doing really good and on the right path. And then once finding human design, I was like, damn, like I was really <laughs> caught up in that whole just like kumbaya. Like, um, yeah, so anywho, fast forward. I discovered human design during COVID, which is crazy because I always told people that I was going to retire in my 30s, but my, my right mind didn't have a plan. It wasn't like I would sit. And that's another thing. I was working for years and making so much money and I was not saving much. Like I would save, then I would buy something. So saving just wasn't my thing. Planning ahead, you know, like defined spleen. Some, a lot of times we don't do that. Um, we're very spontaneous. Um, and then my detriment, 32.1, just, yeah, just not really good with adulting things. <laughs> hmm. um, so, yeah, I, wait, what was I about to say? What was I talking about before then? Well, there was talking about COVID having hit and oh, yeah. that being around Got the it. time of design. Right. So luckily I was working somewhere that shut down completely due to COVID. Um, I was only working three to four days a week and I was making really good money there. Um, but it was a small business. You know, a lot of small businesses got fucked during COVID. Um, can I cuss on here? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, so yeah, th that job completely shut down. And because of that, I was eligible for unemployment. Um, I was on that for about a year and a half ish and then they cut me off um but i said all that to say that i i was forced to retire essentially um because that was in march 20 like march 15th when that when my job shut down and then i found human design in may of 2020 may or april so it was like right after that so then when i found human design and i, I you know i kind of dove deep into it with my studies i was like i'm never fucking going back to work <laughs> Right. Which is what I said, and yeah. So, uh, when so you're mm -hmm. so you're working a lot. There's a lot of busyness around the work, and then the virus hits, and it seems that the business goes down. And so there might have been 
a moment of kind of wondering what's next in a limbo there. And then maybe a discovery of design and then, oh, well, something different, whatever it is. Right, yeah. I never really felt in limbo because COVID was a blessing for me. I know it for a lot of people, it caused a lot of struggles. But uh, I did take a pay cut because I wasn't making four to five K a month anymore. But because of the extra COVID money that they were giving people, I think yeah. I was getting paid like every two weeks. It was like twenty five hundred. Normally, I'd make that, you know, after like a week and a half or something. So I did take a pay cut, but it was still a lot of money to live off of considering I was in my van. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I never really got to the point of like, what's next? Like, what am I going to do next? Um, and I'll kind of ex explain more of that as I get deeper into the story. Um, because, man, like when I found HD, um, one of my good friends had told me about it. He was like, have you heard about it? I was like, no, I've never heard of human design. And then he briefly gave me a description of the four aura types and immediately yeah. I resonated with the reflector. I was like, I have to be a fucking reflector. Like, um, and then I ran my chart and I was like, okay, I'm a projector. Uh, several months later, I realized probably why I thought I was a reflector is because if you separate my only channel, I'm a reflector design and personality when not in synthesis, um, which I feel like, you know, plays a role to the different variations in everyone's design. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think it has an influence in our psychology in a right. in a way. Mm -hmm. Not not so much about how the the being the body will move through space time. That's mm -hmm. just the aura. But mm -hmm. like I've I've got two split projectors, and if I look at my design or personality as a half and half, they're both projectors. But you put them together, and there's this quad motor generator definition mm -hmm. going up so you're saying you're a projector in your design and personality separated yeah. damn okay yeah so you feel me <laughs> i'm sure you yeah well, feel projectors like I mean, that well, one side of me is splenic and that side can communicate and the other side is emotional and that side just feels <laughs> huh interesting i like that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating communicating from an existential wave, but deciding behavior from the emotional wave. Right. And luckily, I guess, you're also emotional authority and synthesis. So um, yeah. versus if it was the opposite, I could see how that could be a little difficult with not self. Um, if there was part of you that wanted to be you know, spontaneous, <laughs> but your actual authority was, but so it's kind of cool that it fell into place that way, at least. Well, I have some, some aspect of safety in that what I've heard from Rod directly was if you're say emotional and you have an undefined spleen, then you never want to be spontaneous. That could be really dangerous. Right. But mm -hmm. being that I'm emotional and I have a defined spleen, there mm -hmm. is some consistent manifestation of reality coming through that channel. Right. Yeah. And it's for me, it's mostly my voice box. Sometimes I can also have that instantaneous response to things. So mm -hmm. there's yeah. always that. <laughs> and so, um, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so you're just hearing about this human design stuff. The four right. Types. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, so then I initially, the person who ended up doing my first reading, um, we really clicked online. Um, I was in the process of leaving a polyamorous relationship that I was in. Um, I experimented my third line with that for about a year. Um, realized that didn't work for me personally. Like, yeah, I'm not gonna get into details why, but yeah. And, um, I had linked, he, he did my reading. He actually was in a relationship with someone and they were also into like open relating. Um, but yeah, it was, it was crazy because I had never met them in person. I had only been talking to them for a couple months and somehow my spleen was like, let them 
be in your van, like give them their van. Cause I was in Alabama at the time and I was planning to link with them, but I had a whole like month and a half before I was actually coming back to California. Um, and they were, were living in a human design house um, called the Wake House, which somewhere in California. Have you heard of that? Yeah, the very first guest on my podcast here is Victoria oh, from Vita? the Wake House. Yeah, Vita. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah. So they were living with Vita and something happened. They ended up leaving there and they're like, oh, well, you're not coming out here for a month. And then like, I just was like, well, y'all go to this address, pick up my van, and then y'all can just sue me from the, from the airport. And I remember at the time, the person that I was with was like, you don't even know them. You're just going to like <laughs> give them your, your van. Um, right. Dude didn't even have a license, but I didn't even ask him at the time. Like I didn't right. like I. It wasn't this thing I thought about. It was some real splenic like. Your yeah, splenic sense. yeah, literally. Like it wasn't like they told me that, and then I contemplated that night, and I was like, I think I'm gonna give them. It was like I'm on the phone with them. They're telling me the situation, and I'm just like, Yo, go to this address, pick up the van, da da da. da. So, yeah. So I end up um, linking with them and. Prior to linking with them, I had the definitive book of human design I, that I had bought. I had the Gene Keys book. So I was um, studying from that material. Then once I got with them in person, they shared a drive with me with a lot of source material. Not many audios, but a lot of PDFs from IHDS. Um, and I remember in my experience with them, because I lived with them from October beginning of October to end of December of 2020. So I just remember like staying up all night. They were both generate, well, one was a manifesting generator. The other one was a um, emotional generator. And I would like be running off their sacral just like up till four, <laughs> 5 a.m. Just yeah. like- You're not saying the three of you in a single van, are you? I am saying that not only was it the van, Ian, it was a minivan. Yeah. <laughs> It was a Honda Odyssey. <laughs> Talk about having an excess of sacral energy to, to amplify. Right. So, so yeah, I just be up like digging because like the definitive book of human design is cool, but I also don't think it's really for beginners um, unless you're a beginner with the intention to become an analyst. Uh, just because a lot of the language and verbiage is like confusing. It can be confusing. Um, when, once I got the actual source material, it was a lot more digestible for me. Um, even though they, you know, Linda Burnell, whatever, worked under Ra and created that book, whatever, she has his name on it. But yeah, it's just, it's not the same. So I know that for myself, I didn't spend too much time reading the definitive book or any of these other more comprehensive other books. Mm -hmm. Because the second that I found that I could listen to Ra speak, that was the most interesting thing for my ears that mm -hmm. I had seen in like forever. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, let me keep listening to this. There's more to right. absorb. I remember uh, Karen Park, Curry Parker, she yeah. worked under Raw too, but I was listening to one of her videos and she was saying that whenever Ra would be um, channeling, teaching a lecture in class she said that like nobody would be taking notes and they all be like in this trance like state when he was talking you know and i believe that was due to his extra design crystal that he had um you know that was holding all this information because it wasn't his mind that knew all of this you know it was just coming from that crystal um so yeah i i resonate with what you said about hearing that's what i'm saying in the beginning I had listened to as much raw audios as I had access to, but and the drive that they had shared with me was mostly PDFs. Uh, it would have been nice back then to have the audios because my, you know, reading a PDF on the laptop is just fucks with your eyes. And me being a projector, mm -hmm. not knowing when enough is enough, I'd just be going and going and going. So, yeah. Mm. <laughs> but um, yeah, so living with them, I feel like is when my experiment really freaking started. Cause you know, I met it in yeah. human design in April, but living with them, people that had already been in their experiment that had been around other people that had been in their experiment 
was what I needed as my as a third line to really start learning because I can read a bunch of shit all I want, but as a third line, I learned through experience. So I was able to see stuff that I had read in real time while I was living with them. And that's when shit started to click for me. Like, yep. whoa, like, oh, that's what it was saying. Oh, that's what it means by that energy. Um, so yeah. yeah I, found, I found the same thing in my own experience that it wasn't just the studying of it. Like that helped my mind to gain a new picture and a new perspective. But like say being able to be surrounded by other people practicing the experiment and everybody mm -hmm. at their own various degree of how long they've been practicing and all the details they do or don't know. And just being able to witness it directly and talk about it in that way. For me, it was mm -hmm. very profound. Right. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think I told you before when I'm dominant first and third lines, it's like seven of each. Um, yeah. So over half my activations are one, three. So yeah. <laughs> But yeah, that's, I feel like is when my experiment really started um, to the point where I felt confident enough um, per their invitation to start doing readings, um, which looking back now, uh, I don't know if it was the smartest thing to do just because of how inexperienced I was. Um, but yeah, so. Um, I started going live on my Instagram, um, talking about human design, just teaching people about it. And yeah, it was a wrap from there. Uh, but yeah, so that was my introduction into human design, how I really got into it. Um, remember, I said I lived with them from October to December, the end of 2020. Now, the next part of my story that I'm going to share is is kind of what I was sharing in the comment that you saw. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's where I I really did some third line shit. Like just, I felt like my life was over. <laughs> it was so bad. Um, at the time though, like in the beginning of that, I, I wasn't recognizing all of that. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that I was taking a lot of psychedelics at the time. Um, yeah, and that can kind of alter you, especially especially when it comes to decision making and trying to discern between your spleen and like what the fucking <laughs> psychedelics are telling you. So, um, yeah. I so, hmm? I was just saying, yeah, because <laughs> that's it's a different encounter with that than I had. For my experience, I had the psychedelic diving in my encounter before finding human design. Mm -hmm. And so to hear that you were already being able to be exposed to that and be like, okay, well, now I hear my mind going off and I'm receiving something else. And well, what does my spleen say? Right. Yeah, I had psychedelics are pretty cool. Um, I started experimenting with them like late 20s. Um, and yeah, just once I wasn't living with them anymore in the van, I was in uh, Santa Cruz, California. And this was like hippie central. Like, so I just like found a plug in. Yeah. So anywho. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so into the most third line thing of my life, I end up meeting this man um, who is about 11 years older than me. And I totally, uh, I ended up in a relationship with him. I didn't enter it into correctly, even though I know projectors were supposed to be invited. Um, I think I kind of took the initiative on that. Um, mm -hmm. And to top it all off, when I inputted his chart, I put the wrong time. And I did oh. not realize that for the first eight months of my relationship with him. So for the first eight months, yeah, I thought this man was a one three. He ended up being a one four. Um, mm -hmm. And 
once I found out he was on Ford, things made a lot more sense because he definitely gave off major fourth line vibes. Um, so yeah, anywho, this, you know, this man, I wound up pregnant a month after meeting him. Uh, he has a 59.6 and I actually got pregnant during a 59.6 transit around Valentine's day of wow. 2021. Um, and very ripe moment, huh? That's a very ripe moment for. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. And I remember, like I said, also like being on psychedelics at the time. It, but I remember feeling the transit and like feeling the conditioning, but like still just like going with it, like because prior to mm -hmm. that. Prior to human design, I didn't know if I wanted to become a parent. I was like 50-50 on the fence with it. And then once I learned I was objector, I was like, fuck no, I'm not having kids. And then this situation happened. And yeah, I just remember now looking back, feeling the conditioning and just letting it take over me, I guess. Um, yeah, you know, it's very third line too, in a way. <laughs> Being able to just have that personal experience with it. Well, I got to feel it for myself that it's wrong. Oh. Now I know that that was wrong. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, um, I wound up pregnant. He had told me early on that he had a mental illness, um, like mm. borderline personality disorder, um, also just bipolar disorder. He also claimed he had disassociation. Um, he had something which I couldn't find this on the internet when I looked it up that he claims is called spontaneous uh, trigger warning suicidality, um, where he would just spontaneously try and kill himself. Um, but yeah, he, he did a lot of self-harm. He had a lot of scars because of it. And you know what my mind was telling me <laughs> at that point? Oh, you you mean yes. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I personally feel like mental illness like everybody that's not self is mentally ill, but there is variations of it due to someone's unique design. But as far as I was concerned, everybody was mentally ill. So he's telling me this shit and I'm like, oh, there's something in your chart that's going to dictate what this really is. And I know that in your life, you've subscribed to this narrative about wh why you behave that way, but I was coming from a whole like psychological human design perspective. And I was like, I can help this dude, you know? Um, and, you know, I, I got pregnant really quickly. Uh, he had the 49 to my 19. So, um, oh. and, and at this point, you know, unemployment is getting ready to run out. So I don't have a lot of time. Um, I've been in that position in my home basically my whole life where I needed to essentially depend on somebody. Um, but I'm pregnant now and I, I, I knew for sure that I didn't want to be the type of mother to leave my kid and go to work and let society raise my kid. So right. I was like, I need this guy, you know, you know, 1949, mm -hmm. the, the shadow is codependency in Gene Keys. So um, my not self was, was, clinging to the fact and he had the 29.5 in his mercury but it was hanging so like the way he communicated was about um, making promises and commitments and stuff that he would do but because it was hanging it wasn't consistent so he'd be like I'm gonna do this for you I'm gonna make sure we have this and that and da -da 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 -da. And I'm like going for it because it's the 29.5 so there's a projection there so what he's saying even though I knew it was there as a projection well actually no I didn't realize that till eight months because it was the 29.4 prior to me finding out he was actually a one four. But mm. yeah, so he, you know, he would say all these things and because of that fifth line projection that that's in that, that energy. A, is that <laughs> an open ego as well? Oh yeah, open ego. Um, yeah, for sure. Like, let me just make all these commitments to you. This will prove that I'm worthy. You know that I'm good for it. Yeah, and I defined his ego. We defined each other's ego because he had the 26 to my 44. So there's that <laughs> aspect of it too. Right. Um, and it's interesting because pri when he was a one three, we had the 1949, the 4426 and the 6124, which is all three 
um, channels were in my incarnation cross. So my mind was also like, oh, that's profound. Like, this must be somebody I'm supposed to be with because like he completes all my channels in my incarnation cross. Like, right, it must be important. <laughs> right. Um, then when I did the chart for him being a 1-4, the 6124 went away and what was replaced was the 3955, which made a lot of more sense to me because of the hostile and um, relationship that we ha had. Because um, yeah, this, mm. this, this guy, um, he knew I was in open relationships prior to getting with him. Um, and I actually decided to leave, you know, that behind me for sure to be with him. But for some reason, you know, insecurity or whatever, he was so hyper-focused on my ex, my, my exes, two of them, that he proceeded to go online and bash them. One of them was in the military and he made like a hundred different post online saying that this guy was a rapist and all these lies essentially and and mind you i don't even talk to this guy anymore my ex i and i'm just like dude you're tripping off of somebody that's not even relevant to what's going on now like i was, mm -hmm. sometimes i would walk into the room and i would see him on his laptop staring at a picture of my not staring excuse me glaring at a picture of my ex like some weird shit like um so yeah, th there was so many red flags in in the beginning that I know were my spleen. Um, and I just, like I said, I feel like heavily due to the psychedelics, I just disregarded it. And my 24.5 is in my design earth. So I can be someone that over rationalizes things. So anytime something would happen, mm -hmm. I would come up with the, you know, conceptualization of like why this was happening. And then I would yeah. use human design to kind of back that up. And it was just a mess, Ian. It was so bad. Um, it was so not so. Um, there were so many epi episodes where I would just be trying to break the bond um, from being around him and he would like go to harm himself. Um, you know, I had mm. to hide knives and it was like, I'm not going to get into too many details. I don't want to make this like a really like, that type of podcast but yeah so um but you so know yeah. what happens to all of us hmm. it happens to all of us in that sense especially when you have that quiet little inner voice that that spleen that's not going to tell you again it's not just going to make you frustrated out of it but it just lets you know once mm -hmm. but then with all your openness in there all this potential to amplify things and then that 24.5 you said mm -hmm really trying to rationalize a story for it that can be good for the reputation well this is how we can fix the reputation i, I will just think about it this way right yeah making sense out of stuff that like didn't make sense <laughs> um hindsight yeah. is 2020, you know hmm? hindsight is 2020 being able oh. to look back and be like oh okay now i see what i was ignoring that i know not to ignore now right and i'm not abstract um consistently but i do have the 33.3 .3 in my personality earth so it does keep me grounded to retreat um and reflect on experiences that i've been through but it's like i don't get that 2020 <laughs> from the hindsight until after the experience is over you know abstract vibes so yeah um Absolutely. so yeah i uh you know end up having a miscarriage on Mother's Day um, right. from that, from when I got pregnant in February and then literally wound up pregnant the next month. Like had a miscarriage, got my period, got pregnant. So yeah, it was like back yeah. to back. And at that point I was already feeling faulty because part of the reason I had the miscarriage, well, there's a lot of in details behind it, but the day that I had the miscarriage, he, um, I was trying to leave. We lived off grid. There was no reception there. Um, I had, I didn't say this part, but I had like kind of moved out of my van and moved into with him, but I was still living in my van because all of my things were there. And he lived in like the small little trailer on a mountain. So it's not like I could bring my stuff in. So all of my belongings were in my van and, um, yeah. So I was trying to leave the mountain one day because we were arguing. And he would not 
let me leave. Like he kept jumping in front of my car, um, like Great. trying to, for- yeah, trying to force me to hit him. And eventually I was able to drive off, but he did, he like jumped onto my windshield and held on to the windshield wipers. So what, <laughs> so what I did, like I hit the brake and- I'm sorry, would you say that again? <laughs> the the connection was kind of unstable. Got you. Um, I said that I was trying to leave and he jumped onto my windshield and right. was holding on to the windshield wipers. Right. So I was able to kind of speed up a little bit and then hit the brake and he like went flying off my car with Whoosh. one of the with one of the windshield wipers in his hand because it had broke. So I was able to escape, but what this man proceeded to do was call the police on me, tell them that I was schizophrenic, um, high on mushrooms, which I wasn't at the time because I was pregnant, and that I had tried to kill him with my car. So mind you, I I didn't have any plates on my car because at the time, part of my experience with the people from the Wake House that I lived with in the van was learning about my nationality, learning about um, private, side of being a citizen, essentially, learning a whole bunch about nationality and and the difference between legality and lawful and and a bunch of things. So um, I didn't have any plates on my car. I had just like the Moroccan flag back there. So for him to call the police and lie on me like that was just super... um, eye-opening at the time and I I remember at that point really just feeling like like I need to just leave this alone like I don't need to be with him anymore but I didn't go and because I had the miscarriage right so like he was comfort comforting me through that and and this guy was like Dr. Jekyll Mr. Hyde like he um as fourth lines can be uh, fourth line love, I, I like to describe it as some of the greatest love that you can experience um, because that confident or not type of thing, right? Like they, they, they really are there for themselves. And they, mm. yeah, it's just a different kind of love. But the, the thing about that, because binary, the kindness, meanness, it's like with fourth lines, when it's good, it's great. But when it's horrible, it is the worst. And, and that was kind of, you know, a theme throughout our relationship. So the conditioning made me stay with him. I wound up pregnant. But I remember, unlike the first time I found out I was pregnant, where I was really excited, the second time I was just so sad. Like, I was, oh. it was just, like, really freaking sad. Um, and at this point, it's June. So after I got pregnant the second time, it's crazy, and my body did not want to be around this man at all. And now, in hindsight, I think about the genetic imperative, and I think about how it doesn't give a fuck about if you're going to have a good life, you know, with this child, or what you want for your child, what your mind thinks is great for your child. Like, the genetic imperative don't give a fuck about that. It just wants to mate to ensure its species. It want, It doesn't care who the people are. I mean, to an extent, because I do know Ra, Ra mentioned there's something with um, weak people mating with strong people because if the strong were to mate with the strong, then our species would die out a lot quicker because weak would just be mating with the weak and they wouldn't last. So there is a thing where it's like, you know, a lot of people look at themselves and like, why the fuck did I have a kid with this person? You know, yeah. it's because your mind had nothing to do with it. You know, like genetic mm-hmm. imperative pairs genes together Um very strategically in a sense um yeah i've seen that i've heard about that how the the weak with the strong and the strong with the weak finds the balance through Mm -hmm. rather than finding a dominance of this trait over here and that trait over there right which could lead to destabilization and then also the natural genetic imperative it's always seeking what you're not it's always seeking the opposite because we found that inbreeding leads to instability and so okay well if we just seek the opposite then you've got this and i've got that and together we have this and that right and so the genes just seeking that out without the necessary care for the experience the personality is having within those vehicles just hey this right. is what the genes want 
We want diversity. We need it. Right. A weird sense of humor, I swear. Right. <laughs> That's yeah. the way I like. I know. <laughs> I'm still, I mean, like so much percentage less, but when I do speak about my experience, there is some bitterness still there um, from being in it, even though now, like where I'm at now in my life, I'm really, really grateful for everything that I went through because if I wouldn't have went through it, I wouldn't be where I'm at now. Um, so, right, so we can we can begin that segue now because I know your your story is kind of coming to its head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, because the part that I really wanted to share with with your audience and you is like how radically living your design can bring the correct people into your life and the correct circumstances and experiences. So, um, right. so yeah, I wound up pregnant for the second time. And like I was saying, my spleen did not want to be around him anymore. And like, I think this was just the genetic imperative. I had his, you know, sperm, the, the job was done. There was no more like, you know, my spleen yeah. just did not want to be around him. Like I, probably from June until September, I saw him like two or three times in aura, but I just needed space. Um, so I moved back into my van um, and then my van was having issues a little bit. So I started using my unemployment money to um, be in hotels because I was pregnant at the time, early on in my pregnancy, but I started to feel like, I don't want to be in this van anymore, like in my circumstance. So, um, so yeah, I, it's interesting because my mind was telling me that I was just taking space from this guy, that I was going to be with him. He was going to help me raise my son because I needed him. This is what my mind was telling me. Right. Um, but my spleen in the midst of all this ended up booking me a one-way ticket uh, to my sister's house, which is in another state. Um, and I think at the time my mind was just like, oh, I'll worry about my return ticket, you know, whenever he gets his shit in order. Because the, the whole thing of me going out there was I noticed whenever I was around, he just wanted to be up under me. Um, he didn't do, he wasn't being a generator and doing things that he should be doing for our family. And I was like, I'm a distraction. So I was like, I'm going to leave, you know, to a different state. And hopefully while I'm gone, he can, he's supposed to be building us like a dome home and like all this stuff on the mountain, you know? So oh. I was like, I'm going to leave and he's going to do that. And, and then all my mind's telling me, then you'll come back and everything will be great. So, um, I ended up leaving to my sister's house and then and right before i left though is when i found out he was a one four so because i uh, end up vita actually did a reading for me and him a composite reading um okay. and she was the one that pulled the correct chart and i was still in denial when she pulled it because i'm like no 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 and then, and then she's like well does he seem more like an externalizer <laughs> or you know more like a martyr or whatever and then i thought i was right. like wow she's right and it was it was the time because he was born at 9 a.m i think and i was putting 9 p.m or something like that I so like right <laughs> so um so yeah i found out he's a one four which, which and then i started looking at his actual chart i saw the switch from the 29 four to the 29 five in mercury and i just was like whoa this is why this dude like just uh so anywho, while I'm in my, at my sister's house, um, his mom reached out to me and his sister who I had never been in contact with before. And they essentially told me so many things about this guy's history, um, things that he had lied to me about, about his past, um, just how, how long it had been since he was diagnosed with these disorders, some of them they couldn't even confirm that he had, so he might have like made it up. Um, like for example, he had told me he was blown up in the war in Bolivia. He told me he worked for the the FBI at one point because um, he's a hacker, so he knows how to like hack into shit. Like I've actually seen him do it, so I know that part is true. But he told me he worked for the FBI before and then was blown up in Bolivia, and he had like this injury on his shoulder. And come to find out the injury wasn't from him being blown up. It was from all the times he tried to hang himself and broke his neck and it just never fully corrected himself. So, 
so yeah, um, they were essentially told me, I don't think you should go back and be with, the, and this is his family, you know, telling me they're like, right. you know, I don't, I don't think it's safe. Um, and then, you know, I'm, my mind is still like, well, I'm not listening to the outer authority. Like, I'm, you know, I'm still going to be with him because he's telling me, you know, that he's in therapy, you know, that he's wanting to change because there were several things that he would do. And I'd be like, dude, this is not going to work. Like, I'm not going to be with you if you're going to be doing this. So he so he be fourth line acquiescing me, like just telling me whatever I want to hear. And right. in in the midst of all of that, he had damaged my he had totaled out my van. And I only knew this because he wound up going to jail for a solicit to commit murder. Um, and his friend had reached out to me and was like, Sin, I'm sorry I didn't tell you about your van. You know, I tried to stop him. I was like, my van, like, what do you mean? And then he was like, he took a sledgehammer and he like totaled out, like he like hit your van and da 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 da. I was like, didn't even know this. Cause mind you at the time, dude's telling me like, I'm in therapy. Like I'm doing all this for my family. Da, da, da. So I had my, one of my really good friends of 15 years. She's a four, six reflector. She drove all the way to Santa Cruz from San Francisco for me. It was like a two hour drive to the mountains to see. Cause I wanted to see like, well, for one, like the state of my van, I wanted her to get my belongings out, you know, if they were damaged in there. He was in jail at the time, so she could just go up to the property and look. And she went up there and fucking took pictures of everything for me. Um, and I, at that point, that was what I needed to happen for my mind to finally disconnect and be like, I'm done with this dude. Like, because on top of all, I could have got past the lies that he told me with his family my mind was saying but like for you to betray me because remember the first time you betrayed me you called the police on me you know i let it slide but this time i'm supposed to be your he called me his wife delusional your pregnant wife and you're gonna destroy my van while i'm in a different state don't even tell me you know because maybe if he would have told me and had some accountability and like you know my mental illness i fucked up my dumb ass probably would have still fucking you know accepted him back but he just right. didn't mention it and his plan according to his friend was to just uh say that something happened and the van got towed away so he was gonna lie to me about it but yeah for him to do that to me and me being a third line you know we're about the material plane like even though i'm, I'm a was a minimalist to an extent at that time that's still all of my belongings were gone because when my friend went up there, the whole inside of my van was molded. Everything was damaged because of the rain mm -hmm. and it being on the mountain. So I lost everything that I owned except for the clothes that I brought with me to my sister's house. Yeah. So Must that, be. yeah, it was, it was devastating. Um, but I do remember not feeling as upset as I could have been because I had already like prepped myself to detach myself from material items. Um, cause I think if I wouldn't have went through that years before, when I moved into my van, I probably just, that probably would have broke me. Um, because you know, third lines we do, we're here for the material plane. We do care about materials. I, you know, I, I had a lot of things in my van that were, um, worth something <laughs> that I had spent a lot of money on. Right. So yeah, but anywho, that was just the last straw At, after that, I, completely ghosted him only yeah. because he has a detriment 6.5 in his 59.6 and mm. I think the line of selfishness in the I Ching I could be wrong but I remember in paraphrasing that it says something about um, you know because that energy is all about breaking down barriers to achieve union so anytime I would try and like break up with him or leave him he would not take no for an answer like he was selfish it's like I would be like, you know, I'm not, you're not going to be together. And he'd be like, no, we are. And, you know, we're this, that. He would not take no for an answer. Even with, uh, right before he went to prison, he was like telling me that he wanted to be there for the birth. And I was like, I can't trust you to come to my sister's house because you're not trustworthy. Like you literally right. will, will turn on me in a heartbeat. Mind you, I didn't even know about my van at this time, but he had already done what he did to my van when I said this to him. I was like, you'd turn on me in a heartbeat. Like, I, I can't have you at the birth. And he was like, well, what if I have someone escort me? What if I do this? Like, he just would not take no for an answer. So I realized I have to deal with him. He just got to cease all communication. 
And it was sad mm-hmm. for me because it's like, I never thought, you know, if I was to end up as a mother that I would be the type to be like, no, you can't see your kid. But here I am was in that situation because- When the person isn't safe. Right, exactly. Um, and just like not even like no communication because, you know, fourth line, not self corruptness, opportunism, you know, you give them an inch, they take a mile type situation. So, so you got to put the full stop. Yeah. So my 33.3 is good at that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's really just like wiping your hands clean, retreat into privacy, leave me the fuck alone. Um, so yeah, I completely cut him off. And from that point on, I went into the worst depression of my life. Um, mm. because now I was in a position, my 19 was like, where am I going to get the resources? How am I going to raise this kid and not have to work? Like, what am I going to do? Like, this was the point that you kind of mentioned in the beginning of the podcast where I'm just like in limbo, like, what the fuck right. am I going to do? Like, this is a serious, like... Now, luckily, and I credit this to my 11.1 in my moon, which is kind of the serendipitous energy of being in the right place at the right time. The people that share your ideas will find you type of energy. But my sister had just had a kid 11 months before. And so in terms of clothes and stuff, I was good. And toys and, you know, anything for a baby I pretty much had. The only thing I really needed money for was diapers and wipes and like food for myself but i had food stamps at the time so i was as far as you know my needs the basic necessities were taken care of um but still my mind was like this isn't gonna last like food stamps you know you can't be on them forever like eventually kids get older you do the more older they get the more expensive they get like you're gonna need money um Mm -hmm. so so i was just really depressed and and it's it's crazy because in my seven centered days where i was like positive vibes only and really on this like homogenized spiritual standpoint um or law of attraction i was like big into that before human design and and according to law of attraction like you attract what you are and like if you're in a negative space all you're gonna do is attract negativity but i learned through my own third line experience that that's bullshit um, because I was super depressed. And despite that, I was getting invitations to be leave my sister's house because that was the best place for me at that time. Um, however, I felt bad as well because my sister was dealing with some domestic abuse with her baby daddy and I felt like a burden and, you know, she eventually my food stamps did run out. So she was only buying the food and I felt like I wasn't contributing anything. And yeah, it was just, uh, you know, and like I said, I got invitations from probably three different people online um, to move and, and, and come live with them, but none of them felt correct. Um, and mm. this, this, this whole time, you know, I, I'm very aware of me being a receptive mind and, I knew that planning and all of that wasn't for me. Now, my mind still occasionally was like, oh, you should, you know, there was a flower shop down the street from my sister's. So I was like, I, I should just go apply there. You know, never did it. And my mind was telling me like, oh, do this thing or, or do that or, you know, make these moves. And I didn't. I just sat there in my passive depression um, until I eventually, um, you know, Dewan, he slid in my DMs and initially it was business related because he was looking for an admin for his group. And so I accepted the invitation to be admin and things just kind of like flowed from there. He's also a receptive mind. So we just talked every day, like all day, like, which yeah. I have never done that with anybody. Um, so when it starts happening and you can't hold it back and there's just more and more to say or <laughs> right. It's just, just being in the presence. Yeah. It was just, you know, like talking to somebody who's as experienced as he is in human design, you know, like 15 years in the game and, you know, I'm barely, you know, three years at that point. 
two and a half years into the game and like yeah it was just super refreshing and yeah I'm event- curious about something about how when you're kind of stressed or depressed about where is the money going to come from because i know i need to make this and so the mind is thinking about these things and the body is doing what the body is doing mm-hmm. is there any kind of descriptive qualitative difference you could give to say maybe any kind of behaviors you could see on your end that allowed the other invitations to find you the ones that didn't feel right and then when when Dewan reaches out was there maybe some other kind of a behavior involved there on your end so for me i had a very strong online presence on instagram um starting from 2018 i believe at one point i had like 8000 followers right now i have like 7 7.5 i lost a lot because of certain things i would post about <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is sure. always it's always a good thing when you lose followers so yeah, yeah um, people moving on it's like oh you're not here for this all right good right but i had a few passions that i would post about um that i stopped posting about after basically end of 2020 if you go to my instagram i probably have two or three posts since the end of 2020 i haven't been posting but i have you know essentially a whole page full of stuff and a lot of it is seven centered when you scroll down a lot of quotes a lot of shit Um, but I don't necessarily resonate with now, but you know, I had certain things like I was talking about my nationality, um, that being something that I was universalizing. Um, and then another therapy that I was into that I would universalize. Um, so as a projector, you know, you're supposed not supposed to, but, um, it's smart while you wait for invitations to, you know, master systems or, you know, just whatever you're really passionate about to just, focus on that while you wait for the invitations to come in. And essentially I wasn't really doing that while I was in my depressive mode, but because I already had an online presence, that's why people would still come and seek me because I had stuff online that was there where people could be like, oh, well, I can invite her for this because she can help me with this or she can help me with that. There was like able uh, room for recognition, I guess. Um, so in terms of like behavior during my b- depression, no, I was l- fully in my experience, very bitter. Um, and, and and granted, some days are better than others. So I might be a little extreme when I'm, I'm talking. I wasn't just like a grumpy bitch all day, but like, you know, I had more worse days than better days. Um, and I don't feel like I was putting out a frequency of like, <laughs> in, in a seven centered standpoint of like, something that would attract anything good at all. <laughs> right, but, right, and this is why I get myself out from the old school superstition. Because I understand the plain and simple logic of, if for example, you are imagining positive outcomes and you're looking out for where things can go right, Mm -hmm. then it is more likely that things will go right because in a sense you're primed for it. You're ready to look for it. So when it shows up, you'll see it. Mm -hmm. Versus if you're only expecting things to be poorly, it probably won't work out very well. Mm -hmm. The superstition is that it's in your mind and your mind has power over the physical. Mm -hmm. When really it's still this subatomic physical neutrino flying through that is giving you that thought. Mm -hmm part of that same bigger pattern it's just another layer of the pattern right because there is some truth to the seven centered law of attraction like because like ross said anything is possible with the not self so you can manifest shit through your not self will it be correct shit no but it can Mm -hmm. you can manifest it you know what i'm saying um it's just not the correct way to do things in these mind centered bodies um And yeah, me, we probably relate on this because your motivation is hope, so is mine. So Mm -hmm. what I can say is that even though I was in this passive depression, there was a part of me that stayed in my hope. And, you know, it's not the regular, huh? 
Precisely. You didn't force yourself to run out there and do something right. about it. I didn't go into guilt and try and fix my situation. I wasn't trying to exactly. fix what I was in. And, and, you know, listening to Rod knew that transferred, um, your transferred color is so important as a projector. He was saying it's as important as responding is to a generator that, you know, that's one way a projector can, okay, am I in my transference motivation? When I'm around these people, do I go into transference? If you do, then they're probably not the correct people. Um, yep. So yeah, I be being in my hope motivation, there was a part of me that knew some, like something was going to change. Like I didn't know when, I didn't know how, I didn't have like a visual, a vision board of like, this is what, a, the invitation I want. This is what I need. Like, no, I didn't have any right. of that. Um, prior to becoming pregnant, I did have, like I said, there were certain principles that I, I would like, like not leaving my kid to go to work, you know, like raising them according to their design. Um, yeah, all of that. So I, I had like a general idea of what I would like for my child but it wasn't like something I was focusing on at all. Um, so yeah, I feel like me being in my, my, staying in my motivation through the depression is what kept me on that trajectory to line me up for the invitation that Dewan gave me. Um, mm -hmm. and, and yeah, like I said, it was business at first and then it, it just, it was just so correct the way we entered into the, the relationship, um, you know, when he originally invited me to come live with him, um, I didn't, even though my spleen said yes in the moment, I didn't tell him that right away because he's emotional authority. So I allowed him to process that and ride his wave and things just kept growing between us. And essentially, I honestly felt like it was the most important invitation I've ever received in my life. <laughs> right. Um, and it didn't come out from some totally different style of behavior within you. It sounds like essentially you had built up some momentum from the past and maybe you were doing a little thing here or there since the older stuff, but it was just waiting for that correct invitation to finally show up. Yeah. Cause yeah, the other couple invitations I got were also from men. Um, well, two of them from men and another one, this other ordeal, but I, I'm very aware of my fifth line body and how people project onto it. Um, and they project that I can help them with something. And yeah, the other invitations, they just weren't correct. Um, and, you know, my mind at the time is, was like, well, if I, if I can't have a partner that like knows human design and not even knows it because you don't even need to know shit about it you just need to know your strategy and authority but if you know right. if, if I can't have that then like I don't I'm not trying like I was scarred from my relationship with you know my son's father I was right. in this space where I was like I don't want to be with anybody like fuck that <laughs> so yeah I just and what what can be easier to trust than a person who knows how their own inner authority functions yeah, I was listening like, to the, the rave psychology earlier and, and Ra was just saying that. He was like, he was like, you cannot trust anyone's not self. And he was like, I'm not saying you can't trust them. You just can't trust them to be themselves, which essentially as a whole means you just can't trust them. Um, so you can trust them to be false, really. If you know, if you can right. see and you can tell that their mind is ruling, then mm -hmm. you can trust that it'll probably continue to do so. Mm -hmm. I keep my hope that at any moment, any person can wake up and start to be true and start that work. But right. I don't hold my breath for other people to do so. I right. just do my best to be the role model that I that I am within myself, just as a human being. Because mm -hmm. I, I got a one three profile, so I don't have the role model within my primary, within my profile. But I've got mm -hmm. a lot of six lines underneath. Mm -hmm. And I just know I'm a nine-centered being who's living from my inner authority there's going to be some of that role modeling element. In right. That. Definitely. And it's the best we can do is just live our own truth in such a way that can inspire other people to do the mm -hmm. same and to see what's going on here. Something seems different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
it's crazy. <laughs> I'm still like just the sudden turn of events in my life is just I'm so grateful and grateful to human design, you know, because like you're saying, in hindsight, looking back now at my situation, it's like I needed to go through all of that because one thing that that situation taught me um, and even just being here with Dewan and learning um, about the cosmology and that, you know, we already know there's so many layers to human design, right? There's variable, there's profile, there's type, then there's gates, and there's line, there's color, there's tone, there's base. So it's like, there's all these intricacies, but then you go even deeper underneath and you have, you know, the 66 stars and you have every certain, you know, your North node is aligned to a certain star and that star's energy is aligned to a Godhead and that plays a huge role in who um, you are. And from a little bit of investigating that I did through some of the stars, some of these stars sound amazing and fortunate um, and bright and just very successful <laughs> or whatever mm -hmm. the case, they sound lovely. And then some of these stars sound tragic, treacherous, um, deceitful, you know, angry. Like there's this these, these subtle energies behind everyone's profile and stuff. And, and that really was something that I needed to further, you know, look back at my experience because, you know, I was able to look up Ashley Star and correlate some things. And even after human design, like I said, I was trying to save him. There was still part of me that felt like everybody in the universe is a good person, you know? And I say good in quotation because morality is, is something of the mind. It doesn't really exist, but I felt like I could bring the light out in anybody. <laughs> and that really? was not the way that I should have been thinking. <laughs> like that is not a good met metric <laughs> to go by because it's not true. And once I learned about the stars, it started to make more sense. Cause you already know about detriments and exaltation. Detriments aren't always a negative thing, but when you go deeper into the stars, you start to see like some people just have a really tragic journey that they're here to experience and share with others you know, well, you and, know there's, and, there's a there's a couple layers that come to me in response to that if mm, i may yeah go for it's, it it's the first off is how in the not self it doesn't matter if it's an exaltation or a detriment because you're going to get the worst of it and then in the true self when you're actually behaving correctly as only you could then even if it is a detriment it'll still be able to be a good thing in your experience. There's still the possibility of finding the positivity within it. Like my detriment is, um, I see it as about a hyper-focus. One of the one that sticks out to me is I have a 9.3.3.3 point X or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so there's this line of the straw that broke the camel's back and mm. the minor missed element that always predetermines failure or something like that. Mm -hmm. so what I see is this 9.3 is just very hyper fixated upon details. And so because I'm looking in at these details and very sharp, I can miss other details because I'm really looking into it. Mm -hmm. And so when my mind is ruling my life, I could lose a big detail that could really mess things up. But when my body is living its own life, it's more like, I'm not fretting the details because my body is clicked into the one that matters in that moment. That part. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. with the stars, with these ancient stars, these far out stars, there is the stories of the old around them. And some definitely sound more positive in nature and some sound more negative in nature. And I feel like something we'll be able to do today in that essence is give more flavor to these stories to see the positive and the negative behind each because it's not like this one star is just going to mean you're going to have a horrible life forever because you have this exact placement or something mm -hmm. i have a hard time ever believing that oh you got the bad placement <laughs> i think it's a lot more about well this is the placement and 
are you able to accept it or do you have resistance around it? Mm -hmm. If you have resistance around it, then it's going to become a problem. But if you can accept it, then just like a supposedly dysfunctional penta, there's no problem involved. Because even mm -hmm. if you're missing parts, like you're working with a family, if they don't have demonstration, okay, well, we don't have this channel of demonstration. We're not going to be going out as a family together and other people can see us as this healthy unit and we're all doing our thing and everybody can see it. And maybe if you don't have that, so long as your mind can be like, well, we don't have that. And so it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. Then there's no problem, even though it's supposedly dysfunctional. Pentum. Right. But, you know, he was speaking to the not self with all his teachings. So everything. Yeah. So when he, he speaks on the not self, and, and he does mention, you know, like how to navigate around that when you are correct. But yeah, that dysfunction is only when you're not self. <laughs> yep. Because yeah, it'll there will be things, gaps there, but you can navigate them when you have the awareness. So right, it'll never yeah. be the problem. Right, detriments are like ghetto passes. I feel like, for lack of a better term, to like, you know, because like you can have two people do the same exact thing, but the one with the detriment is is it's going to like if they're correct. I'm speaking on, it's they're gonna get a pass for that behavior essentially, and not consciously. I'm not saying like, oh, well, let me remember they have a detriment, so they get a pass. It's literally just how the energy works. It's like if you're correct and you're moving in that detriment then it doesn't matter but if you're incorrect you know or if you even not even just being incorrect if you don't have that detriment and you um exude that same energy that this person has because you're amplifying it or whatever the case people are going to come down on you harder than they are than the correct person with the detriment because like i said it's like a ghetto pass like he gets your pass from the universe to act in such a way so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's something that even has me thinking a bit about the profiles and how for me, as a one three, I've spent time around, say, the six twos and the five ones. Mm -hmm. And that's been an enjoyable aura to be a part of. And something for me is this sense of, oh, I wish I could get away with the stuff that you guys can do. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> Just in yeah. my head, it's like, wow, that, mm -hmm. that transpersonal aura really seems like it's got you know, mm -hmm. it seems like it's got some benefit to it, but in reality, the grass is always greener on the other side. Part of our relative minds and this thing of, well, if it's not that, then it's this. If it's not that, then it's this. If it's not that, then it's this. And I'm just going to keep on trying. And mm -hmm. mm. yeah, it's so much nicer when that machine of the mind is no longer ruling and dominating the body and the life. Yeah, it actually, it becomes just, you know, it be like, movie it essentially is like that because the mind never stops doing what it does even when you decondition like it's still going to measure in the way that it's designed to measure but mm -hmm. the only difference is you know you're not going to move based on those metrics um but it is for me very fascinating in how i learned the most you know i'm a projector so I learn a lot through other people uh, about myself um, is through others, but I also learn so much from my own not self, uh, just being able to witness it and see it. And even in real time, because like I said, I'm not abstract. I do have an abstract quality to me, you know, because it keeps me grounded for specific things. But generally in real time, when my mind is doing its thing, I'm there as a witness. And I'm grateful for that only being three years into my experiment and able to at least have that down. Because then since my not self isn't me and I'm a projector and I learn through others, I feel like that's essentially why I can learn from my not self because my not self isn't me. So it's like I'm learning through another entity almost as a projector, because I'm looking at my mm -hmm. not self, I'm seeing what it's doing, and, I, and, and I'm, wow, like, you know, and being here in, in, in this environment with Dewan, and, and just being able to, both of us, us share, you know, us be able to have nine centered conversation, you know, like, 
I know with my ex, um, he hated when I would speak about human design or certain things, or he even tried to tell me one time, like, can we have a conversation where you don't view this from an HD lens? And I'm like, no, <laughs> I can't. Like, <laughs> this is literally how my brain works now. Like, this is the filter right. that I'm using because I'm not speaking. Like, yeah, I'm a human. I'm having a human experience. But the lens that I'm viewing it from is, is different now. And I'm just grateful to be able to have this safe space with my partner now where we both can feel vulnerable enough to share not all of them because I'm a firm believer in the fact that a lot of not self thoughts just need to stay the fuck up there. But for educational purposes, we do share, you know, certain things with each other. And it's great to be able to openly share that and not feel judged and, and not feel any type of way about it. Like it's, it's just so refreshing. And, and now I see and I, and I understand what Ra was saying about like needing the correct people in your life, anybody in human design, but especially a projector, um, especially the closer we get to 2027. Like it, it's really hard to decondition when you don't have support as a tribal person. Um, now individuals may do better with not needing anybody on the decommissionary, but I'm tribal, my only <laughs> circuit. So I do need the support. I do need to be around somebody that speaks the same language as I do. And yeah, I'm just incredibly grateful for that. <laughs> mm. yeah. yeah. I'm happy for you with that same circumstance you found yourself in from from such trying situations and really trying to give your all to somebody else and discovering that somebody else was, well, in a way, not worthy of it, but still having this need to help and this need to support coming through. I can transform this. I can do something about this. Mm -hmm. And being able to witness your own internal guidance system, your own GPS, your own inner authority begin to stand up for itself to learn more about these mechanics and then to to witness the the serendipity of correctness mm -hmm. the fact that you couldn't have planned for this arriving in that at that place where yeah i have no idea what's going to happen to me anymore it's just like i have entered this area where i literally can't see the future you know it's like i don't have some rigid structure and well this happens next and that happens this and this is how it all works out mm -hmm. but now we're in this place we're in the cutting edge and we don't know what ha what's happening next mm -hmm. it's and so freeing place to be scary but it's like man you can't yeah. you can't plan this type of shit out even like just my connection with dewan and the invitation like none of this could have been planned out even I feel like if I would have been a left-minded individual, it's still like, you, you know, your the correctness and your trajectory to an extent, you know, it, it can't, you can't force it. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. and, you know, the left-minded individual with the strategic personality, it's almost like they can, they can more effectively be not self in a sense. I literally was having that conversation the other day about like surrendering and how I feel like it's, I feel like potentially it might be easier for us right-minded individuals to surrender our mind because we already kind of were in that flow versus a left person trying to decondition is just, I could see how that's very much more difficult because there's even that much more control. And like you said, strategy behind how they're living their life. <laughs> So. Have you heard the, the difference in how the left mind and the right mind forms memories? I may have, but I'm open to you reminding me. Yeah. It's one that, that really struck me because as a receptive right angle personality, right variable personality, I am simply taking it all in. I am absorbing the raw information that comes to me and it's just getting stored on the inside and when it needs to come out, it'll happen. Mm -hmm. And I can't necessarily force anything to come through at any certain time, which is why I feel I have a little bit more of a, a natural connection to that surrender. It's because I was never able to use what I learned for my own benefit very well in the first place. Whereas these strategic minded people, the left angle motivation variable, 
they make memories by points and by mm -hmm. dots of information that can then connect to each other and then form mental structures of nodes, these information points that are connecting to each other. And then they can build off each other like clockwork gears. So every memory in the strategic mind is connected to another memory at another place in time. And they mm. connect to create the structure, this clockwork gear that's working in their mind's eye, and perhaps they can really get into visualization from that. Right. Yeah, I believe I have heard that. Um, I like the way that you presented it, though, because, yeah, <laughs> I've been in relationships with left-minded individuals, and it's two different languages. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, you know, you being right and being about that we're going to, there's going to be some dissonance. Um, and also right-minded individuals can even be called stupid by left-minded individuals because we can't just go in there, find a point that's connected to another and be like, oh, let me pull that out. It's like, no, other people are pulling that out based on the questions that they ask us, you know? And I do have like, you know, maybe it's, I think this is just a human thing where certain memories that I have remind me of other things, but it's still, that memory that's pulling that out essentially versus just this focus a strategic focus on all these little things that add up um mm -hmm. and even just like the playing games like mental games like right-minded people i mean not self they can do that but that's not really our forte like we don't play games like a left-minded person to be like you know well i'm gonna leave that over there and see if they do that like because they're, oh, test yeah. they're testing you like it's just like yeah the left angle or the, the left-minded person as the way you described it there is going to be a lot more strategic and they're going to have a conscious agenda and being able to see that oh, okay my mind has an agenda it's okay to have an agenda mm -hmm. that's one thing and to be able to see okay this explains it from day one i haven't had an agenda Maybe my right. unconscious does. My unconscious is strategic and doing its thing, but my personality is receptive. I'm taking mm -hmm. it all in, no mm -hmm. agenda. And for me, that was a weight off my shoulders and a big realization. And uh, I see, I can see how it's been that way from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So nice when you get those confirmations. <laughs> I'm never, never more than human design. That's what blew my mind the most is just like we were speaking about the psychedelics earlier and that was something that i found very profound and the thing was is i was seeking this magic of synchronicity that feeling where the whole universe is like winking at you in a moment mm -hmm. and you can feel how everything's connected and you might not be able to explain every single detail but you can see things that go beyond your comprehension and it's like it's beautiful it's just magic mm -hmm. and i was seeking that from psychedelics and then I found yoga and I found a way to ground myself into it a bit more. And I was like, oh, okay, I can do my own manual work here. And I can just, instead of hopping on a helicopter, flying to the top of a mountain and then flying back down before being dropped off, I could learn how to go on the hike myself and mm -hmm. do my own work. Mm -hmm. And then I saw design and it was just, oh, wow. I see how maybe having some super strict, regular, consistent practice isn't in alignment with my non-agenda personality. And being able to allow my strategic design to have its plan and to have its structure and to follow that, it was just, wow, I found a lot more synchronicity occurring. Mm -hmm. Right. Where things that are not so easy to explain would just happen and it's like, wow, magic is in every single ordinary moment. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> it really is, though. <laughs> it's just you have to drop the your mind's idea of what magic actually is. <laughs> and that's right-minded-ish, I guess, because, you know, the strategic people probably need, you know, a label for what that's going to look like for them, a goal or whatnot. But, yeah, nah, the magic is always there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm. All right. 
I really appreciate you taking some time out of your day and being able to share some of your story and to hold space in the conversation with me. It's been fun. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. It's, it's been, um, I feel like this story, I mean, I've told it a few times, but I definitely, from my fifth line aspect, feel like it could help some people. Um, even though everyone's experience is different, just the power in surrender, you know, to your design. Absolutely. Um, I agree with that because for my own state of life, it has arrived at that point too, where, well, I don't know what happens next and I'm okay with that. I don't need to know. Mm -hmm. I trust it. Yeah. Um, I guess if, if I may, before we go for anybody watching who's like new to human design, um, or just is looking for, um, I guess more guidance, resources um i mean I, i'm always open to sharing source material yeah, yeah. with whoever yes, um so you know if people can hit me up for that but also you know from a tribal standpoint i just want to let people know about you know the buy me a coffee site that we have um the hd for yeah, the people I'll group the yeah that'd be I'll awesome um, cause we do have, you know, um, I think you were in the other li live where we were talking about the booklets, um, that are super affordable, especially like the PHS ones, which yeah, I think some of them are like 30 pages, uh, which right. I, I think, I think the, way you, the way you've got all that set up over there with having these books on specific topics for a nice low price to get some just written out high mm -hmm. quality information. So if you'd be able to send me over the links to whatever you want people people to be able to see, I'll include mm -hmm. it in the show notes. Awesome, For anybody who yeah. wants to find you and reach you and right. see what's going on there. Awesome. Yeah, just because I I know human design is the four percent for the four percent. So personally, I don't feel like it's something that you can really I mean, unless it's not self, but that you can really like just live off of. Um so that's why our focus is just making things affordable um, because a lot of this information is get gatekeeped and also confusing. So we want to be able to right. put that information out there for people to easily digest it and have easy access to it. So, yeah, I'll definitely send yeah, you those here. links in, yeah, to anybody watching. If that's something you're interested in, like just check out our site. We have a bunch of different um, booklets or courses or even like these um, comprehensive reports that are super cheap. So like 35 bucks, you get anywhere from business insights to PHS. So yeah, um, just wanted to put that mm -hmm. out there. And thank you yeah, for letting me do so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm happy to be able to plug whatever is going through in your process. So there's no like new projects or something coming up that you want to talk about? Oh, well, I don't know when you're going to post this episode, but we do have the cosmology presentation coming up this Saturday, June 24th okay. at 3 p.m. CST. Um, so, yeah, that'll be a live presentation that Dewan's putting on um, to Not discuss. You. I have participated in one of his previous rave cosmologies. Oh, did you? That's awesome. Yeah. Would this be a retelling of the same story or is it a... It's same story because you know the creation story is what it is but he has updated the graphics um and also i guess a little bit different in the way that he tells it um i think last time he presented it more for people that had already been in their design for some time for them to be able to wrap their head around it and this time his approach is also like all right well let me present this to somebody who didn't even know what human design is so he's going to kind of like correlate that into it as well um which is pretty cool but you know he has the gate of the skills <laughs> gate 16 is his conscious son i know yeah. you're familiar with that energy so he's just all about refining his projects so he looks back at it and he's like oh it could be so much better and that's what he's trying Always. to do so <laughs> Always. Yeah. That's great to hear that he's into that continuous improvement as well. Because I saw his large photo, basically. It's a, one of those almost like infinite zoom photos where you can zoom in and just keep going. And you can yeah. also zoom out and see a big picture. And mm -hmm. it's just a really good, big, 
picture perspective, but I definitely can recommend it for people that are interested in learning. Awesome. Yeah, he's really creative. <laughs> I don't have any of that juice, I feel like. But yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if people uh, are interested in that, um, I'll also send you that link and they can book. And if you know they miss it, there will be a recording that they can access as well. So no FOMO. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So this will be up basically from right now forward it's been up live ever since and oh. so yeah yeah so i'll basically just ask if you had any final parting questions or comments before we conclude um i guess i'll message you on that because I, I do i have something else that i feel like i was debating on going live myself or maybe if you'd be interested in having another conversation because it involves um, mammalian designs and my personal experience behind some conditioning and just some crazy shit in. I don't know if you have any pets, but if you do, I highly recommend that you <laughs> know their design. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. it helps. It helps and there's spe specifically there's a gate, I won't get into too much detail, the 4253, that if your animal has that gate and they're neutered, um, then it brings depression into that animal's life. And because you hang around that animal all the time, it as a result makes you depressed. You take on that energy. Um, and yeah, I have personal third line experience with something like that. Uh, that is just crazy. I get goosebumps when I think about it, but it's something I haven't been able to universalize yet, but I want mm. to, because in America, especially like most, you can't even, live in an apartment if your animal isn't neutered. So I feel like because animals have less gates, you know, mammalian design is like fifth or, uh, yeah, I think yeah, it's like, yeah, so the likelihood of them having one of these gates or, or that whole channel, I feel like is high because there's less probability. And I feel like there probably is somewhere where people are experiencing depression because of their animals and they don't even freaking realize it. So. I don't know. Yeah. That's a, a topic that maybe we could discuss another time because I have a whole story on it. Um, but right. yeah, I don't really have much else to say except for thank you for having me. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing. I'm definitely open to having more of a conversation around that. Okay. Mm, the, the, these conditioning forces that we may not be consciously aware of because mm -hmm. I remember Ra talking about when he first started to track the moon in the ephemeris and he could see how that lifeless rock up in the sky made me cry. There's <laughs> something going on here. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's how the animals, you know, they're, that's their sign essentially is the moon. That's how they, so yeah, it's very um, interesting. So yeah, I I'll message you or I'll let you ride the wave on that and then uh, we'll talk soon. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. Thanks again for being here and hope you have a great rest of your day. All right. You too. Mm -hmm.